Will and I have known each other since we were professors this big, you know, so we were very small professors when we first met. But um, if you talk about your work, even... Is the microphone working? Oh, how could that possibly have happened? Um, uh, if you talk about your work a lot, even remotely a lot, after a while you find yourself standing on stage, your mouth working and ideas not coming out. So I thought I would try something different tonight. And I'm going to combine um, uh, quite old projects with new projects. And the reason for that is that lectures are a way in which I can understand some of the themes in the work. So I've artificially divided the projects into areas like context and um, houses. But I mean, it's just a way of presenting them. So the first, the first group of projects is about context. And the first is the Listen Gallery, which was made in 1992. And this is what it looks like. Um, maybe some of you have seen it. Maybe some of you weren't even born in 1982. I don't know. I um, was talking to two of your students about London in the 1970s, and I realized that that was a long time ago, so I'm not going to dwell on when it was made. But this, this building was um, uh, made for a, a gallery that was emerging very strongly in London as uh, a new gallery, and it had, um, it had people like Anish Kapoor in it, but it also had artists like... Dan Graham, who's a fantastically interesting American conceptual artist. I think it had Donald Judd and people like that. So they're very big players. But it was in a, a peripheral district. It, it built a new building in a part of London that was inexpensive. Um, and um, it's particularly, uh, let's say, it, the configuration of this facade comes partly from the fact that uh, it this building faces to the north over an open schoolyard, so it gets great light. Um, and also, being a commercial gallery, all of the exhibitions have to be taken in through the facade, so all of these pieces move. It's like as minimal as you can get. You know, there's no backspace, there's no storage space, it's just an exhibition space. Um, and it's configured as galleries there and there. And then there are rooms above which are supposed to be apartments, but they're used illegally as offices. And this is what the um, gallery in the ground floor looks like. That's the street outside, and you can see that there's a wall 90 centimetres high, and you discover in use that this, um, this gallery is below the street level, and it does that because this building had to join to an earlier building that we made for the Listen gallery, but it, it does something to the relationship between people outside, people inside. This photograph is taken from, you can see that vehicle there, it's taken from the position of these people. And we actually, we commissioned these photographs from a photographer, a, um, a photojournalist who worked for the Magnum Agency, who was one of our clients on another job. And this was at the time, it was groundbreaking. Nobody was photographing buildings in action. So, and nobody was photographing them in black and white. So these were quite um, important decisions. But um, on the upper floor, first floor, you can see that, that let me just go back. There's a, a wall there. And then when you look, you're above that wall. And you can see this schoolyard, north light coming in. Um, and if you make a gallery space lit from the side, you have a choice. You can either make little windows or nothing, um, or you can do this, which is to uh, make a, a wall of glass um, and then see what happens. And in fact, what happens is that um, some artists treat this view as just ambient stuff, and they display paintings. And so when you turn back this way, you're, you're looking at the paintings, you're absorbed in them, and then you see the city. But other people, like Dan Graham, actually chose work. They, they chose work from their body of work, which had a relationship to things in the distance. So he chose these pieces of sculpture because they have a relationship with this pyramidal roof. 
other artists have blocked the window up or made it um, covered it with uh, blinds. So it, this is important to me to say. What I always try to do is to make architectural spaces which are definite, perceptible, real places, but which turn out to be ambiguous, which turn out to have other ways of being used. And um, it's just something I do. And the other thing to say is that, that this space is the proportions are imperfect. They're done by eye. I don't work with numer numerical relationships or proportional relationships. Looking for me is very important. And these rooms, the, the length and the breadth are slightly unequal, and the height is non-modular. And it's, the idea is, and the actuality is, that, that the quality of this space has some of the informality of the spaces outside which were formed by chance. And a lot of art galleries, you probably know, are made in buildings that already exist, which have this chance-like quality. Now that's something that artists like very much. You know, they like the informality of existing buildings. And one of the things that I was doing here was to see how you could make a building in the present which had qualities of that relaxed quality of older building, like the building we're in now, where it's used really without any reference to the architecture, and that gives it a kind of vitality. I think that's important. And this is a view from the, from the schoolyard. Can you see over there? If I move out of the way. Um, you can probably see this. Wow, you've got a really terrible view. You should look at this. Can you see? This is really good. Actually, you want to be right close. It's much better. OK, let's do a bit of audience participation here. Um, so this is a boy and girl Muslim football team. Um, and that's the building in the background. And what, what I want to say about this area is that, I don't know if you have areas like this in Berlin, but, but London is, um, it's, it's, in the last 30 years, it's some social, uh, sense of social space has been stripped away. You know, Thatcher and the right decided that um, uh, there would be no social spaces and there would be no public spaces. And you get this. Um, you get over a century of um, cities being made purely pragmatically and purely for money. You get a city which is, um, uh, in, a, in a way, in comparison with formalized cities like Berlin, is a disaster. And a lot of what I'm doing here is to say in this gallery, as well as making a space for art, to say, look what we did to say, this is the culture of London at work. And it's interesting. You know, as an architect, you're in control of very little. I think it's interesting to recognize how objects and spaces are made by forces you don't respect and you don't have control over. And an important issue, for, or an important statement for me to make is that, that I'm interested in uh, the world around me as in English you would call it a cultural artifact, something that's made by lots of people somewhat anonymously, which represents our values. And my interest is how my architecture can respond to that. So this, these two photographs show the idea here that there's a small space where you're looking at art and then there's a space outside these two groups of people that don't look at each other, don't connect, somehow connect at a distance. And for me, it's important also when you make architectural spaces, and this is a very British perspective, it's important for me that the possibility of connections between people, even if they're just small, that those, those connections can be made, that people can feel that it's worthwhile being in a space with other people, and in the surroundings with other people, that they can begin to recover an idea of what um, social activity is like. To finish on this project, I want to um, talk about how it has a relationship with its surroundings. <coughs> At almost a purely formal level, you know, for example, this window up here, which is a, like a loading door, you wouldn't go off and bring art in has similar scales to things in the surroundings. So it's, um, you know, it works with 
it works with the surroundings. And on looking from the other direction, this old house, it, there are alignments which are quite strict. You know, there's an attic up here. It's quite old fashioned. This shop has a window and a door that you go in, and the gallery has a window and a door that you go in. And so, it, it, in a way, it, it's a very, I'm very uh, willing to use conventional material from the surroundings and do something else with it. I've, I'm really uninterested in inventing a new, well, that's not true, but let's say, uh, I'm uninterested in those practices, say like IMA or um, Herzog and Dumeron, where, and they're very brilliant, but where their uh, obsession with uh, newness means that there's certain things they can't do. And I'm not interested in that. I'm much more interested in another kind of invention using um, forms that exist and which have communicative possibilities. And this just shows the simplicity of the plan. You come in here, come into the back, and then you see the street again. Now, a new project in a similar vein, in a similar location, called the Rumi Foundation, a man called Rumi Virgi, who's, well, he's a millionaire, but he also is a social activist. He does work in um, Brazil and um, the Far East where he comes from. And he wants to build a building in, the, um, in this place. This place which is on the east side of the city. First, the first building, the Liston Gallery, was on the west side of the city. This is an east side of the city. <clears throat> a bit like East Berlin. An area which, um, well, decrepit like this, and yet absolutely full of artists, full of people buying it up. It's now um, terribly fashionable. And what's interesting is there's no architecture at all. And this building uh, that we're going to put on that site, um, which will be like this, will be the first um, significant architectural building in this area. And just to go back a bit, the only piece of formal architecture is this avenue of trees, which connects further back to a, a rather formal arrangement of houses. And our building does something with it. It does a number of things, but it principally, it has a facade which is made of mesh like this, and it has spaces behind it which are outdoor spaces, and it has plants inside it. And the plants continue this, or they pick up this um, line of planting. They continue it into the area which is less advantaged. But also, and I'll show you in plan in a minute, what this does is it creates outdoor spaces for five lofts, five apartments, which he wants to have for his extended family and for guests. And then on the top here, he'll have his own apartment. Now it's interesting because he already has a house in London, and he has another house in Rio de Janeiro designed by um, Oscar Niemeyer. So he's a house collector. But that is interesting. I said, Rumi, why do you need so many houses? And he said, well, some people collect paintings and I collect um, houses. So this influences how we designed. And I'll show you what we designed. So in essence, these are the diagrams that we showed. And this, this shows how these very rudimentary relationships are built into a project. The, uh, area, the space between the building envelope and the street is filled with different types of greenery in different shapes. And I'll start at the top. This little diagram here shows you where you are, but this is the floor of, the, of his apartment. He probably will spend two days a month here. So it's um, a pleasure place. It's a place where the living area has these garden spaces that cut into it, pinch into it. So it's, um, wherever you look, there's a different type of, um, of uh, garden, a different kind of um, pleasure. This has water, for example. And he'll probably entertain here. I think probably what will happen is that, that when he has groups of people who come to discuss the business of social entrepreneurship, he will entertain them here. And on top is his bedroom. And the roofs... These roofs have got different types of gardens on them as well. And it's a fantasy. It's a fantasy where you wake up and there are different types of... Um, there's a, a sauna here. And this is all in an area that's very, very tough. So 
so there's this um, rather New York-like contradiction of um, sensorial luxury that um, was originally very um, deprived. And below here, typically there are large apartments. And then this space, which, as I said earlier, has, it has a, like a metal screen, which you can see through, and planting in it. And a big garden that you can walk out onto. So these apartments uh, can have a kind of communal life outside, can be seen from the street, and yet um, are separated from it. And you can see the illustration there of how that would be. And on the floor above, there's a, um, a different type of apartment with balconies. But really, the spaces that matter from his point of view are the ground floor space, where you come in at the corner, and there's a room which he wants as a salon. And it's either a place where you can have lectures like this, or dinners like this. And it's a real, um, we, this is a long way to go on this, but this is a place where he has discussions with um, groups of people uh, in a very informal way. And then in the basement, there's the office space which supports this foundation, which has upward views, and it's surrounded on three sides by planting. And then a, a basement. It would, it, you have to, it's very interesting. If you're dealing with very rich people, it, it's bizarre. I'll show you another house where this is an issue. You have to, you have to drive in, the doors have to close behind them, and they have to be secure from being robbed. It's a really bizarre thing to work with rich people. And this is, this is a section which shows you something of the character of this space, and that's what it would look like. So a, a different uh, thing from the listing gallery but with some of the spirit. Now the third project on contextuality is um, a housing project in Copenhagen on a site called Tietgensgrund. And this is a very strange story on this one. This, um, I'll tell you, this, um, <coughs> the location of the project is here and here. This is a view this view here is taken from that street. And the locale is, has a, it's part of a, a formal development which was started in about 1760. It was a, a Rococo a planned, um, a plan in um, Copenhagen which has um, eight palaces at one end, very beautiful. And then at this end it has a marble church. And the, the king of Denmark ran out of money, couldn't build it, and so it actually was uncompleted. Until about 1895, when a developer called, called Tietgens built a, 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 a plaza of apartments around the marble church and finished the marble church. But he could never buy this site. The owners would never sell it to him. So the plaza was never finished. And it's a sort of cause celebre in Copenhagen. It's been a gas station and a hot dog stand. It's very strange because the Queen of Denmark drives past all the time to go to church. This is her church. So it's very, it's very Danish and you know, very tolerant of this stuff. But it's, it's of course celebre. And the, these houses here are very, very early. So the, we were, we won it in a, private competition. We run the task of um, building a building here, which is an apartment building in the style of today, which completes this ensemble, but keeps this building and this building. So it's a very difficult project, and this is how it's looking. So from the street side, the church would be here. There's a, we're aiming to make a building here, which looks like this. I mean, th this is this, um, these two buildings talk to each other. This building uh, is part of a group of much older buildings than this, which are flat fronted and with windows. But actually on the other side, on the, um, the church side, it's much more explicit what we're doing. In an absolutely direct way, we're taking the rhythms of this uh, Beaux-Arts classical building, three divisions by pilasters, three divisions by pilasters, and somehow taking the most minimal version of it, which gives the continuity that we're talking about, but then 
does something else with it. Here you have, in those panels, you have a window. Um, here you have a big opening full of glass. Sometimes that opening is a loggia. Here you have balconies, which are just for flowers. In this project, you have balconies you can live on. In this, the original project, the attic was where servants lived. And here it's a penthouse. So it's a sort of critique. It's a development of um, this building, which was actually, a, well, it was the last of the Beaux-Arts period, you could say. And then the modern movement, 30 years later, came in and gave all sorts of different values, like the fact that you wanted lots of light, there was a lot more freedom, social classes had broken down. So these, these two buildings talk about that, um, that moment in history. And on the side, it gets very interesting for me. Th this building, let me just go back, the abstractness of this building um, also lets me connect it to these types of buildings, which are, have very simple forms. You might have noticed they have a visible structure in the front. So the constructed quality of this and openness, openness of this connects to that. And the hope is that, that this will finally draw all these elements together. On the side elevation, I should say that, that it's arranged as an apartment on the front and one at the back. So one there and one there. The apartment on the front has a loggia, which is rather beautiful. The one on the front on the street is much tougher, has a loft-like quality, and it has um, terraces in here. South sun comes in, so they're not disadvantaged. But that means that this facade is very, um, very abstract, and it's the kind of facade that you find in unfinished cities. A facade that likely, which reminds me of the way that London was formed in the view from the Listen Gallery, you know, formed by chance. And this is a preliminary rendering of how it may be showing those relationships. And this building, all of these buildings, not the, the church is made of marble, which is very beautiful, but the apartments here are made of um, stucco, a, um, a traditional Danish stucco. And we're going to make this building in stucco. It's going to be very difficult, but we're going to do it. So this will either succeed handsomely or Fell spectacularly, we'll see. Um, houses. The um, houses are a, a sort of curse to architects, really. They're, in a way, they're the things you don't really want to do because you get the client wants everything to be very intense. Um, you get very close to somebody's life in a way that you don't want. But we do them. And the, we often do them for people that we really like. Um, and then we do it for people who are rich and famous. So this is a house for two artists that we practice new. And it's, it's um, well, it's in a terrace of, of uh, Georgian buildings. This one's reconstructed. But, and it's a conversion of a, a building that was here, which had been inserted in the terrace about 1910, very crudely, very badly. The budget was very low, so we couldn't knock it down. So we did an outright conversion, as you'll see. And the objective, we, we just changed some of these window proportions. And we did that so that you'd get this, this top window would line with that parapet. This balcony rail would have some of the qualities of that window. These windows, which are a German window system, Aluminium on the outside, wood inside have similar proportions to these window frames. So, in, in the same way as the Listen Gallery, there are quite measured connections with the surroundings. And then the whole thing is in uh, stove <coughs> stucco, which is, was red, and then it was painted black by my client and his wife. They actually got up and painted it in kind mineral paint. So they said it was the toughest job they ever did. They, they put it on and they washed it off and they put it on and they washed it off. So. The idea, which actually didn't work out, but the idea was that it would look a bit like this brickwork, which has got dirty through the years. But actually, it's a bit more like a Rothko painting. But stuff like that happens. But at the back, nothing. You know, um, back elevation where we, um, they, um, I mean, a lot of a lot of practices do this in London. You know, completely nakedly untransformed. Crusoe. So this is my kind of Crusoe syndrome moment where. Um, yeah, I'm doing a completely unmodified building with bits added to it. 
But um, uh, anyway, that kind of stuff happens in London. And this is the section. So the facade I first showed you is here. And the one I last showed you is here. And the, the ground drops as you go around the street to a park at the There's a studio here which starts off in the basement, but actually is in a, uh, it's at ground level. And it has a roof light here and a window here. And so that's the studio for the man of the couple. It's two married artists, man and woman, who have two children now. And Tim, who paints, I'll show you his studio in a minute, paints down here. And Joanna, his wife, who works with photography and needs lots of light works on the top. And between them, between those spaces, they look after their children. So their children sometimes will spend the day with one parent, sometimes with another parent. So they, it's very, very charming how they do that. And that's, this is Tim's studio. So he's, uh, he, paints, he likes to paint by electric light. He likes to look at the paintings by daylight. And these are some of the spaces that they live in. They built a lot of this furniture themselves. It's, um, they did a lot of the interior work themselves. And this is their bedroom. And at the other end, there's a, between the street and the bedroom is the bathroom. So you can use it to stop noise from the street, or you can talk to your partner in bed while you're shaving or brushing your teeth. So it's full of small um, observations about domestic life. And then on the top floor, this is Joanna's studio, which has views out over the rooftops and lots of light. And uh, these doors open, and there's a balcony. The, a, a much more uh, uh, richer house, it's called the Red House in London, for a, an art collector. Um, called Alex Sainsbury, um, and that's this, that's this house. Um, this is, uh, in a way, this, this district is, is like a very upmarket version of um, the area around the Lesson Gallery. This was a district that was made in about 1880 as um, bohemian housing. You know, Oscar Wilde lived up the street. These were all painter's studios, um, but every single site was developed in a different style. And we put this house in here, and we did a couple of very small things. We recognized that there was a change between this plane and that plane, and the facade lines with both of them, so we get a very spatial composition. And we made it from a completely different material from the surroundings, a red stone. These are the garage door is open. Um, there's a decorated room behind it, which is a garage. And it's, um, it has a, a, well, it's a very old fashioned plan. It's a, it's a house full of rooms. Um, and each of those rooms has a different character. On the ground floor, it's um, rather measly. On the upper floor, and I'll show you an image of this, it's Italianate. And then uh, on the roof, there's a, a group of bedrooms with a roof garden. But let me show you in the section. Also complicated. So, for example, on the first floor, there's a room six meters high. Next to it, two rooms three meters high. Um, so, it's the uh, room that projects into the garden, and the bay window, a bay window which you saw in the front with a, a, an angular view of the river, and then that that room. The, 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 this room that has a strange ceiling. It was designed by a Canadian colleague of mine, Mark Pimlot, who um, Bill knows. And if you have a large painting collection, you have to light it electrically. And if you're not careful, you end up with a, a ceiling covered in lights, like an art gallery. So Mark's solution was to make a ceiling which has these slopes in it, and then they in these cuts, there's lighting which lights the paintings and the occasional hole in the ceiling. So it's a very spooky looking ceiling. Um, but it, it, this is a, a room which unashamedly is Italianate. It's like a Piano Noble or a Dutch um, canal house, bel etage, but not quite. And these just show you some of how it comes together, what it looks like. <coughs> And on the top floor, a series of bedrooms with a bathroom and a courtyard in it. Um, 
with a hot tub. So this is completely planted now. The idea is that um, and if you make a big house where somebody lives all day, um, you have to do something quite particular. And my model for this, where Italian palazzi, where everything was too big and nothing had a specific purpose. So this is a house full of rooms which suggest use but don't fix purpose. And so, for example, um, in this room, there's a guest room. In this floor, there's a guest room here, which they sometimes use as a studio. So sometimes they won't ever leave the top floor. You know, they'll get out of bed, bath, go and work. Um, and then they might go back into the larger room of the house in the evening and find it again. So each, what happens is that it's not like a space of modernism where you see everything together. It's an intentionally separated house where you discover parts of it again and again and again. And there are some rooms of small scale, other rooms of large scale, which lets you do that. And the Anish Kapoor house is a very different um, project. Very, uh, not in fact a house at all, more of an interior. Um, let me explain. So, where's the house? Well, the house, Anish's house, is underneath this block of apartments here. So he bought this block of apartments, which had a piece of land that ran along for about 40 meters underneath it, and ends up in the street at the back like this. So. It's got one elevation, which is the back elevation. And in plan, this is how it goes. The elevation I first showed you is here. And that, the elevation I second showed you is here. So it's very, very long. And it consists of a, um, a, really, a kitchen and a very long living room, which is where they entertain, they show art. It, he works here. He doesn't work here, he, he lives here. But as an artist of this kind of caliber, they're always entertaining. So it's a space where he, um, everything's on show. And he didn't want any privacy. It's very interesting. He wanted this huge space because you know, they had this big area of ground. And so what we did is we, we made it, I think, tolerable by, um, well, we solved two problems at the same time. One is we got light in by having these courtyards, a courtyard and a garden. Um, and some other means that I'll show you in a second. So you come in here, and you don't immediately see this room. And then you discover it. And then you go here, and this is their bedroom, looking back on the garden, and there's a bathroom underneath it. And on the floor here, floor above here, there's a staircase that takes you up, and there are children's bedrooms in the study, <coughs> with another courtyard which has a glass floor, which is over the dining room. So well, that's the section. In, um, that's the first courtyard, and then there's a courtyard above, which is lights here and then a garden. So it's complicated. I mean, it, there's, it, uh, and it leads to a certain type of house where it's sequential. So as you come in, you start to discover what's going on in there, and you see the staircase in the room ahead. Then you see that there's this courtyard, which opens out. And I think they're going to plant this, but this, these are very early photographs. And then the living room itself with the garden at the end, the staircase that takes you up to the children's room, and then the garden, another shot of the garden, their bedroom, which looks back, and a bathroom, which is underneath, has roof lights here. This is all, it, it's not quite finished in this photograph, but it's, um, it's mirrored, etched mirrored glass, so that, you know, you, in, in a lot of cases, in, in this house, where we had um, not very much light, we used polished surfaces to somehow sustain the light and extend it. And then on the upper floor, the study, and then the children's bedroom with a view out to the surrounding area, and Anish and Susanna's bedroom here. Um, public buildings, um, well, they have a completely different character from houses. In a house, you're designing for somebody's, um, uh, very closely for somebody's tastes. In public buildings, you're designing much more generically. And I'm going to show two um, uh, public buildings. And they're, they're sort of strangely juxtaposed. The first one is very small. It's called Faith House. And it's in the countryside in the UK. And it, it's on a very large country estate. And this country estate was. The owner gave it to a group of people to work with um, uh, people who had physical 
and uh, mental disabilities. So they care for people, and they do that by um, uh, exposing them to nature, um, by using art therapy, by doing um, other therapies. And they wanted to build and have built a series of small buildings around the area, which are in amongst buildings that exist already. And the first building that we made was called Faith House. And the function of that building was um, a place where people could meet, but it also had a religious function. And we, this is the building, um, we, in relation to what I've just said, we were, we said, well, I, don't, I said, I don't have a faith, so how am I going to design this? And they said, well, we like your work. And I said, then you have to tell me what, you, what symbolism you want. Because you can't, I don't think you can build a, a religious building without some kind of symbolism. And they said they didn't want any overt uh, religious signs. They didn't want crosses or stars of David or crescents. They wanted a building which um, dealt with the relationship between human beings and the natural world. So, unusually, we were given the choice of putting this building anywhere on the site. This is the first time it's ever happened. And we chose to put it in this garden here, which is at the end of a very, very long road that brings you into the site. And then you stop here and you walk to this house across the lawn. And the, the house is positioned at a division between the garden and a field where they grow things, which goes down to the sea. So let's say there's symbolism there already. But also, very consciously, this building was made transparent to the surroundings and surrounded by a large sky. So it's about um, the enormity of nature and the small scale of human beings and human endeavor. But it also has relationships to this building, so it forms an ensemble. And you walk up to it, and there's a porch. And then uh, you come in here, and you can look back across the garden. Um, and then there's a room here, which is for quiet contemplation. And this was really where the symbolism was difficult. So we chose a circle of trees. We cut trees that had trees cut down from the forest and I put them in a circle. And it works. It's very interesting. It works for people. It's a symbolism I've discovered is mean meaningless. It doesn't have specific one specific meaning. Symbolism, uh, symbols have this power of evoking uh, feelings in people. And as a person who's an atheist, you could say this is a very interesting um, discovery. And uh, you have to do these buildings. You have to not be ironic or cynical. You have to somehow recognize you're dealing with uh, a type of activity that you don't participate in, but you have to do it wholeheartedly. And it's interesting. This, well, this is another space where they hold conferences. It's very small. It's only about seven by seven. And it opens to the field. So, Often, if they're having an art exhibition, animals will put their head in the door and stuff like that. So it's very, it's about a rather rude, rough connection with nature. And it, it's interesting. When, I, when we opened this building, one of the therapists said that um, she thought this building was like a blank canvas, a blank canvas on which she could project anything she wanted. Was I upset by that? And I said, no, it's exactly what I'd hoped would happen. And there are other. This is just some more photographs of showing those trees in relation to the... It's an all wooden building. Um, and this is the plan, so you approach from here. That's the lobby. That's the big room and the small room, and the field is over here. Now, to juxtapose that, or to put that in juxtaposition, I'm going to show the British Embassy, British Embassy that we're doing in Warsaw, in Poland. <coughs> I don't have many slides of this, but... Um, it's an interesting combination of things. So this is the site. Um, it's in an embassy district. Um, Erik von Egerat's um, uh, Dutch embassy is about here. Um, and this is an early rendering. I mean, this is very difficult to do something with um, just an embassy. Erik had an embassy in the, an ambassador's house, which gives you a lot more to work with. This is what's called the chancellery of an embassy. It's just the working spaces of the embassy. So um, what do we do? Well, it, it has, the site has a beautiful park at the back. And so 
Part of what we did is to create two roof terraces, which are slightly modified now, which um, are ambassador's roof terraces, which are highly planted, and then a double facade. Originally, we were going to plant in that facade, but we've gotten into technical difficulties with that. But it's still interesting, and it now looks like this. It's much more developed, and you can see that that's a roof terrace. The configuration is that, that these are all the public spaces which open out to the garden. And then this is a single office for the administration of the embassy. This is um, uh, ambassadors, and then this floor is for espionage. And if you go to if, look at embassies, the top floor is always where the spies are. So on the, this is the ambassador's terrace, and it has these very large gardens. And then in the middle of it, there's a, a courtyard which goes down into the, this floor below. Poland has a real problem with um, light in the winter, and the legis building legislation um, compels you to have lots of glass in the facade. This facade is also a double facade. It has an outside facade which, and an inner facade, very simple. In the winter, it provides lots of thermal insulation. In the summer, you are open here and here, and it exhausts air, because this is faces, this face is south. And, um, it means that you get a facade on the outside which is very light and then on the inside a much more secure facade because embassies now have to have very high levels of blast resistance and so the inside has more substance and smaller windows. And so it's a very minimal object and yet we're hoping that the building inside it, the more formal building inside it will be a sort of ghostly presence. So you come in here under a stone portico and you go into this mysterious building with glass in the roof and a shadowy building inside it. And then there's a whole interior. It's an interior space which looks out onto the park that I showed you. And the final um, projects, two projects, are art museums. And the first is the Camden Art Centre in London, which is a conversion of an existing building. These models show what it was like. It used to be a library, and um, for a long time it was used informally by the Camden Art Centre to show art, but it also they made art there as well, so there were art classes. And this, um, we were very restricted with this project. We couldn't really do what we originally wanted to do, which was to modify this whole front and get uh, the ability to have people walk in on the level. Um, so we had to do something different. We actually had to put an entrance here on the side. Um, and, but what we found in the middle of all of this was that at the back of the building was a huge garden which nobody knew about. And we were able to put a cafe on it, which was part of their brief, and to make this a real public space. And I'll show you how this works. It has it's right next to a very, very busy road. Let me show you how it works. So this is the entrance. So it's a new object juxtaposed onto an existing object and it has uh, small relationships, as you've probably seen in all the projects. Um, you come in, look back, and you can see the, there's a very large circular staircase, which was original, which has been abandoned. And then, then the cafe, which um, opens onto the garden now. This area, although it was rather upmarket, um, had no bookshop, had no cafe, and the art centre provides all of that. So it does a real social act in doing that. And, but mainly it produces this beautiful garden with um, uh, beautiful in the sense that it's good to be in. And you can perhaps see the top of a London bus there because the screen, it's screened off from the road by a, by a glass screen, um, which means that it's just about acoustically tolerable. Everybody takes their children here on a Sunday, so it's become a real, a real social space. And then, but also what it lets known to the world is that the cafe is there. And it's important for art organisations in London to make money. You know, there's a very interesting um, relationship between art and commerce that's occurring in British galleries now. And the final project, which we just completed, is in southern Denmark. It's about two hours south of, um, of uh, Copenhagen, and we won this in competition. 
And it's located in a, an, a country estate called Fulsang, which means birdsong, as I'm sure you probably realize, which it's like a kind of dogma <coughs> film. You arrive and light is shining on everything at 25 degrees. You know, the gravel path makes a noise under your feet. It's a spookily Danish in the most beautiful way. And um, the location of the building that we chose was there, but I, I'll just explain. So there was a farmyard with a pond for animals and a, an agricultural building here, and then a, a manor house, rather sort of old-fashioned manor house, but from about 1880. Um, but although it was a working farm, they've always had a cultural program. Like uh, the composer Carl Nielsen used to work here. And so they still have concerts. And people also come and stay in the upper rooms here because they want to go to this landscape. From the, um, let's go back, from, from, from this side, there's open ground. And it go, it's absolutely flat. It goes through an area which is a bird, a bird reserve, a nature reserve, and then into the sea. And when I went to look at the location doing the competition, the program for the competition suggested that the new building should be here. It should block that view. And I, I thought, that's wrong. So we did this. We put the building here. The view I'm talking about is here. The manor house is over there. We put the building here. Now, we did that, and this is a, this is a rendering which shows the, the impression that we wanted to, what we gave in the competition. We wanted it to be that when you first arrived, the first thing you saw was that beautiful landscape, and then our building would be here, seen obliquely. And this is what it's like. So you arrive, and the, this landscape extends over here, and then you, the building, First of all, it has these objects in it, which are, if, you, if you're seeing a building obliquely, you have to give it some profile. But this part steps out, so when you come up close, the view, that view goes away, and you go into the building, and then you discover the inside of the building, and this is how it works in plan. You, that, that space I showed you is there, and you come into a cafe here, and there's a, a fruit orchard here, so you see that through this art room, and there's a auditorium, all that kind of stuff, and a bookshop. But then the gallery starts here. There's a big connecting gallery space, and then three groups of galleries on the side of it. So this is that long room. And the, this is the gallery with an exhibition of giant sculpture in it. And this, um, hang on. So on, on the side here, there's a group of rooms which are for um, the paintings in the collection that are from the, what's called the Golden Age of um, Danish painting. And they've, they've got decorated ceilings, if I can make this work, yeah. So they've got decorated ceilings. This is that um, object which I showed you, it turns out to be a, a zenitel, a roof light. And it puts light on the middle of the floor, but it keeps it off the walls, which for paintings of this age, which need low light levels, works very well. And this, ceiling, the ornament on the ceiling absorbs things like tracks and gives them some order. And then at the end, as you can see, there's a sort of enfilade. At the end there, there's a room for plaster casts, which are much more tolerant of daylight and can be seen against the, the, um, uh, the landscape. Then to go back to the corridor, which is here, on the other side is a very large room for temporary exhibitions. Um, this is it in a config several different configurations, but it's it's subdivisible. It has a ceiling which is a sort of grid with roof lights above it, and they can all be the light condition can be changed. So you could have a dark corner over here, or you could partition it off. So it's a very different from the um, the other galleries that I just showed you. Uh, it's a kind of contemporary gallery space. And then at, far along the end, there's a group of rooms which t simply have roof lights that, um, and have the modernist collection in it. So you get three different types of gallery space, but they're connected stylistically. So your, the gallery spaces 
operate in the background of your view. You look at the paintings, but the background changes and stimulates you in a very subliminal way. And this is it with different types of work in it. And then to go back to that long corridor, that also has a ceiling which, where light can come in. It's darkened in this photograph. And you could, you could use this space in several different ways. You could, it could be completely darkened, you could have video in it, or you could have furniture in it, or you, could, you, know, you can use it in lots of different ways. It has that ambiguity I spoke about in the listening gallery. And at the end is a room for just for looking at the landscape. And this, in this photograph, the landscape isn't complete, but when it's fully finished, this land will appear to come right in up to the edge of all of the buildings and into that farmyard, so that the, at the, the um, meaning of that space changes from being a place of agricultural work to a place of experience of nature. And then just to finish, these are photographs of the outside. That's that space, and um, you can see that that this building, although it's very abstract, has quite sim <coughs> similar, connect similar qualities to this building here. It also, it also has a connection, visual connection to the manor house, which has three bays in the three gables. And then these just, uh, I'll play out with these, which show that it also has this relationship to the agricultural buildings around it. So while it's a, uh, you know, when you put a, uh, a gallery with a very formal art collection into a space like this. There's a responsibility to um, mm. somehow integrate its, its um, character with the surroundings and the character of the experience. So in this gallery, you see the landscape, it's taken away from you, you see it again, and <coughs> it, um, somehow it positions you in the landscape in the same way that a painting positions you in the landscape. It fictionalizes the view. So your experience is taken to another level. I mean, we can all look at a piece of open ground, but the nature of art and creative activity is it lets you see it in a deeper way. Thank you. We've got a reputation for doing it, but we do are doing lots of housing in, in Holland, which hasn't been realised yet, so I didn't want to show that. Um, well, you know what it's like. You get into a groove, you know. People keep bringing you work, and you say, yeah, I'll do it. Um, but I like the arts. But I, it, it seems to me also that the experiences you have in galleries also can be brought into use in um, other aspects of um, Work. Now, when we're making projects in Holland, we're always looking at the view might make a relationship to the interior of the house. You could only, I think, do that if you've made art spaces where all of the visual quality would be very sensitive and very directed. So I would say that, that we would be able to bring um, a lot of, um, uh, let's say, sophistication to um, the other types of buildings that we design. But we do. We do housing as well. well. On the other hand, I would also would like to ask a question the other way around, because all the projects, the galleries, look like a house. So I think this project would uh, move it from this and you would uh, tell someone that it's a house. It's, mm -hmm. it's also a house. So in a way, I well, think it's interesting that this, 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 it never looks like a gallery, it never looks like a museum. It, no. it, it's, it's, well, don't yeah, that, that all of these projects are in quite domestic locations, you know. And we're now shortlisted with about 19 other people for um, the Munch Museum in Oslo. 
that's right on the waterfront. And I, I imagine that we're going to have to do something much um, more demonstrative. Now, that's going to be interesting. It's sort of anti-iconic, so, um, you know, but we've got to win this one. So watch this space. It's going to be interesting. to say you know in in any piece of architecture there's in designing there's an act of will a decision about what you will and you won't do and it operates at a level that's in well is it instinctive it's it's not done by reason it's done by looking and thinking as you look so it that's how you make those kinds of decisions about what you will and you won't do if you look at Alvaro Caesar's work you can see in his drawings how he's the things he will and he won't do. And it's a matter of deciding what you will do and what you won't do. And then you get you get the result that you want. I'm not answering your question very easily, but but I don't I'm I mean I don't want to be mysterious, but I think creative activities um it doesn't necessarily have to be brought into reason. And it can't be brought into reason. But it's not any more special than cooking or communicating with somebody or, or communicating to them by the way you wear your clothes or what you choose to, how you, your body language. For me, design is very much about how we already exist as human beings and communicate with each other. And that's done um, semi-consciously, you know? I mean, it's done, it's done in a state below a rationality. It has to be, simply because it's um, it isn't rational. It's not examinable, but it works up to a point. Except when you make a huge error, and then you know you've made a huge error. But mostly it works. So you decide. Well, actually, the truth is, I only know. I've only begun to know what I'm doing in the architecture by looking at it after I've done it. And in the process of doing it, I'm not. I have some broad ideas. But I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing. It's very, very instinctual. You know, we work with models, and um, I draw things. People say, "How about this?" And I say, "How about this?" And, um, and it's, you know, what design is like when it's when it's moving and it's saying things. That's really where the um, qualities of the, the uh, building come into being, and that's how it should be. I and mean, that's that's how designers work. Of course, they surface, reflect on their work think they might not do this again. But when you're doing it, it it's a legitimate activity of um, immersion and um, absorption. You know, like when you're cooking and doing it right, it all works. You know, and you, you know you, there are things you've learned over a long period of time and you've absorbed as technique. It's not, it's not intuitive in that sense. It is, has technique. You know, you've, over a long period of time, you've learned how you might do something and then you do something else with it. Is, that, is this making any sense at all? <laughs> a bit. OK. Um, as we're in Berlin, I was just wondering if you have, if you know Berlin quite well. Not very well, no. So my question is a little bit, when you were talking about the Danish project, hmm. um, picking up on the language of what was across the street, Oh. While I totally understand the perspective and so on, and I can see the beauty of that project, a similar argument is made, has been made in Berlin since the fall of the wall, and there's a number of buildings which make the same argument with a much less happy outcome. And I just wonder if you have any criticism of that, or what you feel about that, and that on the city scale. Um, which projects are you thinking of? Because I am. Um, I mean, <laughs> pretty much. Oh, all right. Uh, the whole hmm. sort of centre of Berlin where um, the, the, re the regulations were quite clearly to hmm. respect the 22 metres. Sort of well, it, you see, you know, my position is that, that I'm a sort of minority in a sense in, in a situation. You know, I arrive, the projects are quite small. In a sense, I don't, 
I don't have to do what was done in Berlin, where they, they had this historically um, loaded situation where they had to decide stylistically what they were going to do, what the building form of the city should be, all at a time when the architecture was um, perhaps not in great shape to answer those questions. So to be not, I would, it would be modest of me to say I could do it better. You know, I think I, the power of my work comes from always being in marginal situations. It's, it's, so it would be difficult for me to know what I would do in that situation. Well, we'll see. When I do this um, design in competition for Oslo, then I'm really, you know, it, it's got to be right out there. And, um, and it's got to sit right next to Snow Haters building, which is hugely populist. But I want to do it, and I'm interested. I'm interested in how architecture works. You know, I'm interested in the inner workings of it, and those kinds of tragic questions of how cities sometimes have a great moment and they really make themselves, and other times you just think, I wish they hadn't done that. It is, you know, architecture is driven by all sorts of forces that architects can barely contain, and if you're lucky, everything just about fits together, and if you're unlucky, you get bad result. You know. and London's absolutely full of buildings which you wish hadn't been built. You know. And I, I'm not being passive in this, but well, who, I'm just trying to think of who really, who really gets a grip on um, urban situations. I mean, I can't think of, well, big players. But, um, but Berlin, I don't know, Berlin seemed to have had a, a very the dialogue wasn't productive. There seemed to be groups of people in Berlin who had very different views and not actually much um, intrinsic um, uh, pleasurable architecture as well. And so it was disastrous in a sense. Yeah, it, it happens, you know. It does happen. well, sometimes you get um, Brasilia, which doesn't work and looks beautiful. You know, it's just... It's... Uh, it would be good if everything really was rational. It would be good that... If, if when architects had to step up to the plate, they found it inside themselves, but sometimes it's not there, you know, it's, um, it's a tricky one. Sometimes you get Georgian London and um, generic um, Barcelona, which works by its urban form. If you look at the individual buildings, they're actually not very interesting. Um, in a sense, it's worth studying how um, successes and failures are made. If, if that's an issue for you, it's, it's worth thinking about. Being, being readied is... It's interesting. In a REM, I think, always wanted to build at a certain huge scale. He readied himself for it. He wasn't... He didn't... He never... If he did small projects, I can't remember them, but somehow the, the thought was always at this um, scale, which... Sometimes it produces horrible results, but actually it's, you know, it's a fantastic thing. Gary developed from very small to very large and proved that he could work at an enormous scale. And he probably didn't know that. I mean, I, I saw the project that Gary did for um, the Maison Carré, which Foster won. And it was, to just would never have won. It was, because his language was still in the process of being developed. And then suddenly something happened, and he, he was capable of doing um, Bill Bear. And these are things you, you just don't know about yourself, you know? I mean, you, you really... Who would have thought that Foster, who is a dull technocrat, could have produced beautiful buildings and then completely destroyed his career by making complete crap, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's a human profession, you know? Does that answer your question? <laughs> interesting with Anish. He said, you know, Anish is a sort of great star, you know. Makes Zaha look like the Osmonds, you know, kind of really, you know. 
when it comes to outstarring people, he's a great star, and he said, we're going to collaborate on this. And I thought, it's impossible. And I said, sure. <laughs> and it, it, I knew that if, he's, if you're going to employ an architect, and you're going to employ an architect with some reputation, they can only do what they do, right? Unless, unless the relationship between the client and the architect is fantastically productive, which has happened about twice in my experience. Real generosity, real flows of um, intellectual flows, which is very rare. So I'm proud to say that there's not a single thing in Anish's house that he designed or influenced, that I did it all. And it, it, I mean, it sounds vulgar to say it, but actually it's important to say it, that, that you can't... A lot of people like artists like that think somehow they can manipulate their architects. Well, they do do it. It's very interesting. The owner of the Listen Gallery had had enough of me. I don't want to work with you anymore. I'm going to work with people that really listen to me. You know, somebody like Sarah Palin, who really articulates you know, the views of ordinary people. So he, he hired another architect who... Um, I won't name, but and, um, the works, the extensions to the listing gallery are rubbish. They're just meaningless architecturally because, because the architect offered no resistance. You know, he didn't bring anything to the table. He just said, yeah, all right, you know about art. You know what art spaces are, but they don't. Artists and architects, artists and museum people don't know anything about architecture. I mean, fuck all about architecture. And actually, they don't want to admit it. So it's a game. You have to say, yep, this is terribly interesting. But actually, you have to think, OK, we'll, we'll give them something that really works. But you have to do it. Otherwise, you end up with a piece of work that's no good. You know? And there are plenty of buildings in Europe that you look at, which are museums, which have, where the clients obviously interfered very deeply with it and completely ruined it. And the other thing is that you only get, uh, there's a certain architectural intensity and reality which only comes if the architect is, um, has the space or can manage the space to um, make original thought. And clients don't realise that. They don't realise... They do in the end. I mean, it's interesting. Anish likes that house very much. But, and he was all right as a client, but um, I couldn't really... I couldn't discuss stuff with him. I, there's no point. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. We had one interesting conversation where he... I mean, it was very productive and friendly, but there was one moment where he said, that star-shaped courtyard, he said, it should be more like an object. And I said, well, no, no let me tell you something. Look, um, a piece of art is looked at by people... First of all, it's put in a very specific way into a space, a gallery or a public space. It's positioned very carefully. People will look at it for, if it's a painting, less than 10 minutes, and they might, never, they might not see it again for 10 or 15 years. A piece of architecture is looked at all the time, so it has to be able to resist um, being exhausted. And it sometimes has to be able to be an aesthetic object, and sometimes it has to be a background. Now you're going to ask me how you do that, but it's an act of will to do that. It's an act of thinking, you think. And I said that to Anish, and he said, yeah, I got it, you know, I understand it. But he, he didn't, up to that point, here's somebody who'd worked with architects and built buildings with architects, and he still hadn't understood the difference between art and architecture. And um, people don't. They don't, they don't know anything about architecture. They think they do, but they don't. And you have to recognise that, and you have to you do them a disservice unless, you, um, unless you're professional. I don't mean that you're mean to them. You listen very hard, but you can only give them architecture back. And in the end, if you're any good, they thank you. you know? So does that answer your question?